Uh, my name is John Wirth. Uh, my title is Professor. I'm in the Department of Anthropology at the University of West Florida. We're standing in the middle of the Tristan de Luna settlement, the settlement that was here in Pensacola on the bay from 1559 to 1561. Today we're in the midst of our eight week long field school. So what we're doing today is essentially continuing day by day excavations down underneath the surface of the ground in this residential neighborhood hoping that we can eventually go through the artifact filled layers where all the debris and everything accumulated and eventually get down to the bottom and we're looking for post holes. We're looking for evidence of architecture, structures, uh, houses, maybe even things like the Royal Warehouse or there was a church as well. So the students are learning to do archaeology by doing archaeology here at the Luna Settlement. Tristan de Luna was charged by the King of Spain via the Viceroy of New Spain to come to Florida, which was the southeastern United States in general, and eventually was going to set up a colony on the Atlantic coast of what is now modern day South Carolina. The way the Viceroy and Luna strategized this was to come up from Veracruz, Mexico, across the Gulf, and then establish a first port uh, city or port town in Pensacola Bay, which had been found 20 years earlier during the Hernando de Soto expedition. And so Luna's goal was to set up a port and a colony for about 100 residents eventually, and take an army of cavalry and infantry all the way back across the interior southeast. The Luna Expedition brought 12 ships and 1,500 people and 250 horses, about half of which actually arrived alive. And their goal was to set up this port uh, where they would then re be, be resupplied. And from the port town, they were gonna move inland with this army of 500 soldiers, half of which were infantry and half of which were cavalry. And they were gonna then pick up the old Hernando de Soto route go across the Appalachian Mountains and eventually descend down to the Atlantic coast. So that was the goal. But what happened was when they arrived and they chose settlement here on the edge of Pensacola Bay on a nice level high terrace, five weeks later, a hurricane struck. And unfortunately for them, they had yet to build a solid good warehouse where they could store all their food. So they unloaded all the people and the goods that could survive the weather, but they left all of their food on the floating warehouses, which were the ship. Survivors of the fleet all congregated here and they had almost no food. And so all of a sudden the expedition changed from, you know, moving inland and achieving their mission to how are we gonna survive? 1,500 people stranded here in Pensacola Bay with very little transportation and they still had their mission, which was to move inland and eventually go to the Atlantic. But Tristan de Luna, the governor, uh, wanted to move forward, but he also wanted to keep everybody alive. So they stayed here and they sent word to yes. Veracruz to send more supplies. They sent three remaining ships that were still here, they sent them to Havana to buy more supplies very quickly. So they spent several months essentially yes. waiting for return and, and relief. The relief fleet showed up in December and they got some food from it, but eventually by, by February and into March, they realized that no more food was coming for several more months and they were starving. So. Luna had sent a detachment of soldiers inland, and they had actually found a large Native American community called Nanipacana, somewhere on the Alabama River. We haven't yet found the archeological site of it, but it was big, and the Native Americans in that area had a lot of surplus corn, which for the moment at least was available. So Luna eventually decided uh, they built two new brigantines, small oared vessels here, and they were gonna use them to carry a lot of the supplies over to Mobile Bay and then up the Alabama River and the rest of the people were gonna go by land. So they actually cut a road between here and central Alabama. So they moved inland and they left about 100 people here. So this settlement, the Luna settlement, was occupied for the five or six months that they stayed in the interior by a small skeleton crew of soldiers uh, who just lived here to guard the port, just in case ships showed up. So afterwards, once they were inland, the Native Americans in that area sort of realized the Spaniards were not really good news and they pulled away and they took all their food. So they no longer traded with the, the Spaniards and Luna arrived just about the time that the local Indian groups were burning their fields, cutting their corn crops down, burning their own villages. They even tore up all the wild foods that were near the Spaniards to try to encourage them to go. <laughs> so an event, eventually Luna uh, acceded to the demands of his men and they returned to the coast. And from that point, more relief fleets came here. So essentially this settlement dwindled in population. It started at 1,500, then it dropped to about 100, and then it went back up to maybe 800 or 1,000, and then they started sending people back. Every time a relief fleet would arrive, 
several hundred people might leave. So a year after Luna got here, this settlement only had 362 living people. Gradually, this settlement congregated around sort of its core area. So in other words, the, the big site that was initially founded and where we find artifacts eventually got much smaller. So we today are digging right in that core area where I think they spent literally two years living here and setting up housing and eating and fishing and hunting and doing whatever they could to survive. What we're doing here in this excavation is seeing if we can find traces of what their life was like. Uh, we've got trash pits, we've got all sorts of uh, horizontal distribution with like shells and burn bone. So it might be able to tell us something about the strategies they used um, to survive. How did, how did they get fish? How did they get deer? Um, what was their diet like? Did they have a lot of relief supplies? We might find evidence of things like corn from New Spain or wheat. Um, there's a lot of documentary records of what they brought but there's zero, really almost no documentary record of what they did to survive while they were here because they were too busy surviving to write about everything. So all we have is sort of secondary accounts. So it's really in archeology span that we can find the details that never got written down about how Luna's colonists eventually persisted. Some of them didn't make it. The parish priest, for example, died and is buried somewhere out here. But everybody else that did survive had to have a strategy. So that's sort of what we're looking for here. We've done shovel tests, meaning holes, sort of grab samples in the ground that allow us to determine if there are 16th century Spanish artifacts or, or not. So we ended up bounding the site. We know it's about 31 acres or so. So over time, we've gotten a good sense of how big the site is and then where the hot spots are. Um, and in the core area, we've been finding a consistent range of artifact types. We find lots and lots of broken Spanish pottery, everything from these big, what we call Spanish olive jars, which have these big, thick sort of donut-like necks. Um, that was used to carry wine and water and vinegar. Uh, and then the smaller version of the same thing was used to carry olive oil. And we find cooking pots that were glazed, lead glazed. We find uh, casserole dishes that were used for cooking. Uh, a few, a small number of plates made out of what we call majolica, this white tin enameled uh, ceramic occasionally painted. So. Those are the kind of ceramics we have. But one of the neat parts about this is that in addition to being Spaniards from New Spain, they actually brought 200 or so Aztec Indians converted you know, in the, in the city there. They were Christian Aztec and they came with the expedition. So we have a lot of Aztec pottery. Um, a lot meaning a small percentage, but it's actually more than has ever been found you know, in, the, in the Southeastern United States. So the Aztec pottery we have though, it occurs in the same areas where we find lots of high fancy, uh, high status Spanish material. So it looks like the Spaniards in 1559 who were residing in Mexico City simply went to the markets right there in Mexico City and they incorporated Aztec pitchers and vessels, bowls, serving bowls into their kitchen. So essentially the fact that we're finding Aztec pottery doesn't necessarily mean that it's Aztecs who were using it. It means that Aztecs made it and Spaniards may have brought it as their own personal possessions. Um, we've got lots of military hardware. We have uh, hammered copper crossbow bolt tips about this long that we've got, I think eight or so, a couple of uh, iron ones that were made in Spain. We have an amazing assortment of uh, fasteners, we, uh, nails essentially, nails and spikes um, from the large ones that are as big as my forearm all the way bit down to the teeny tiny uh, wide headed tacks that would have been used on the ship's pumps to hold the leather down uh, to the wood and make the pump work. Um, we've got all sorts of interesting things as well. We've got, um, one of my favorite artifacts on the site is a little tiny biscuit shaped lump of uh, brass that's been carefully worked and it's got a stamp in it of a castle and a big X on one side of it and a little C underneath. And after doing some research, that was part of a set of weights for a balanced scale weight. And so that particular weight was one, well, it was 10 Castellanos, so 10 for the X, and a Castellano was only used to weigh gold. And since it wasn't like they were going out looking for gold here, because that's not what they expected to find, what happened was that the treasurer was the only one who would have had a set of weights to value people's estates. If somebody died who had a little bit of jewelry or whatever, the treasurer was the one in charge of making an evaluation, an inventory of what they owned, and then they'd sell it off at auction. But he had to evaluate it, so he had a set of weights, and that's probably one of those weights. So 
in addition to being a really neat artifact that's very unusual, the presence of that artifact might suggest that that's the location of the house of the treasure, whose name we know, Alonso Velasquez Rodriguez, and know a lot about his history. And he might have lived on that very spot, which is kind of neat. The, the Luna settlement is the first multi-year European settlement ever to happen in the continental United States. There is no earlier one. There are two earlier short-lived settlements in Florida and another one on the coast of Georgia. But Luna's settlement is the first one where they stayed several years. It was also the largest. Um, this is the biggest 16th century archeological site of Spaniards in all of the continental United States. It's bigger than St. Augustine and Santa Elena on the East Coast. It's bigger than downtown Santa Fe at the end of the 16th century in New Mexico. So we have the largest site. We have the earliest multi-year site. The fact that this settlement with all of its people living in it was right next to where their entire fleet wrecked right offshore is an amazing archeological opportunity because we have the ships that brought all these people and all these supplies that were literally at anchor that wrecked right offshore. And then we have the place where the supplies had been offloaded and this, the assemblage of pottery and different artifacts that we find on the shipwrecks versus what we find on land is, is identical. And it's an amazing opportunity to get a, a sampling of the terrestrial material culture of Spaniards and Aztecs and servants and their African slaves and others who lived here and then compare it and with the very same ships, not just any ship, but like literally the same ships that they came on. It's just, it's just amazing. I, I can't imagine another archeological site area that would be more important than something like this for studies of early colonial expansion, European colonialism in the 16th century. It's just, just a phenomenal discovery and one that I hope we'll be studying for decades to come. <laughs>